In this lecture, we are going to discuss more on the topic of stationarity. Previously, we looked at how different kinds of ARIMA models might fare on the airline passenger's data set. Of course, we were just guessing. It's not easy to tell what are the right orders to use when fitting an ARIMA model. In fact, this is the case in general for machine learning. In a deep learning, for example, one question I often get from beginners is, how do I choose the hyperparameters? How do I choose the learning rate, the hidden layer size, the number of hidden units, and so on? I think today, people generally have a better understanding, but when I first started my courses, it would make people really angry that there wasn't some formula that they could use. Indeed, hyperparameter optimization isn't a topic for students who like simple, direct, and straightforward answers to their problems. Usually, it amounts to nothing but trial and error. As I always say, machine learning is experimentation, not philosophy. If you want to know whether something's going to work or not, well then you do an experiment. In any case, this idea will come into play later, but for now, what I want to say is this. For ARIMA, there is a way that you can scientifically and methodically choose your hyperparameters. In our case, these are the orders P, D, and Q. Note that this process is not exact and does not necessarily lead to the best answer. However, it is statistically sound. The first scenario I would like to consider is stationarity. As you recall, this will help us choose the order D in our ARIMA model. So this lecture will be split up into two parts. The first part will be a more beginner and practical oriented discussion. We're going to look at how to determine whether or not a time series is stationary in code. This involves doing a statistical test and checking the p-value. The second part will be more advanced and it will discuss stationarity in a more exact manner. The second part is optional, so feel free to skip it if you want to jump straight to the code or if you do not like math. So this is the first part on the practical aspects of stationarity. Stationarity, loosely speaking, means that the distribution of the data does not change over time. That is, if you look at things like the mean or the variance at any point in the time series, they will always be the same. Looking at when this is not the case is helpful. For example, if you see a time series trending upwards or downwards, then you know that the mean is changing. Therefore, the existence of any trend means that the time series is not stationary. Furthermore, when the variance changes over time, that is also not stationary. So if at the beginning of a time series, the value only wiggles around a little bit, but then starts to wiggle around more and more later, then that's not stationary. We've seen this behavior in stock returns, which have heteroscedasticity. So one might consider stock returns to be non-stationary. Although, it is often assumed that they are. So don't be surprised if we treat stock returns as if they are stationary in the future. Let's now talk about a practical issue. How can we test whether or not a time series is stationary? Luckily, there is a well-known statistical test that does exactly this. It's called the Augmented Dickey-Fuller Test, or the ADF test for short. As we discussed earlier, one way to think of statistical tests is like an API. We have a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. We plug our data in and we get a p-value as output. We check whether the p-value is below our significance threshold. If it is, then we reject the null hypothesis. So really, we don't have to understand the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, we just have to know what it is for we have to know what the null hypothesis is and what the alternative is. Once we know these things, we can use the test. So what is the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that the time series is non-stationary. The alternative hypothesis is that the time series is stationary. So if we find a p-value less than say 5%, then we will reject the null hypothesis and we will say that the time series is stationary. And just to bring this back to ARIMA, how would we use this? Well, recall that this all has to do with the I component of the ARIMA model. We want to difference our time series until it becomes stationary. So the process will go something like this. First, we just have our raw time series. 
Maybe it looks pretty stationary already. If so, we'll do an ADF test. If we get a p-value below the significance threshold, we'll say it's stationary, and so we'll then fit the rest of the ARMA model. Or equivalently, we'll fit an ARIMA, where we say that d is equal to zero. Otherwise, we'll difference the data set. Then we'll run our ADF test again. Again, if we get a p-value below the significance threshold, then we'll say it's stationary. Since we differenced once, we'll say that d is equal to one. If the ADF test still does not reject the null, we might difference again. All right, so let's move on to the second optional part of this lecture where we discuss stationarity more in depth. So what is stationarity? Previously, we've only discussed this concept informally, but now we are ready to be more exact. In fact, there are two kinds of stationarity, strong and weak. Strong stationarity means that the distribution of the random variables in your stochastic process does not change over time. As a rough example of this, suppose I take an arbitrary window over some time series. Then, suppose I move this window over tau time steps. Strong stationarity would say that the distribution over these random variables is the same no matter what tau is. In other words, no matter where I look in the time series, I see the same distribution. There is a very formal definition for strong sense stationarity, but this is definitely not necessary to understand for this course. In fact, in the practical application of time series analysis, strong sense stationarity is not used very often. A more practical kind of stationarity is weak sense stationarity. Weak stationarity looks at first and second order statistics rather than the full distribution. As you know, first order statistics usually corresponds to the mean. Second order statistics corresponds to things like variance and covariance. You already know the informal definition of weak stationarity. It's that the mean and the covariance don't change over time. All right, but now we're going to look at this in a more exact way. Luckily, I think these are pretty straightforward. If you don't find that to be the case, it's not absolutely necessary to understand what we're going to do next. So for the mean, it just says that the mean at time t is equal to the mean at time t plus tau for all tau. That makes sense. It means that no matter where we look, the mean is always the same. For the second order statistics, it gets a little tricky. It says that the autocovariance for some random variable y at time t1 and some other random variable y at time t2 is only a function of the time difference between t1 and t2. Now that's probably confusing, so let's think about what that means. First of all, what is autocovariance? Well, auto means self. We've seen this plenty of times, autoregressive model, autoencoder, and so on. The autocovariance between y at t1 and y at t2 is really just the covariance between y at t1 and y at t2. The auto part really just means that y at t1 and y at t2 come from the same time series. Again, this is just the covariance. And what is covariance? Well, we've learned that it is the unscaled correlation. Therefore, it tells us how related two random variables are. If they are completely unrelated, then the correlation and hence the covariance will be zero. If they are related, that is, they move together, either in the same direction or the opposite direction, then this value will be non-zero. If they move in the same direction, then the covariance will be greater than zero. If they move in opposite directions, then this value will be less than zero. So why does stationarity mean that the covariance can be written as just the time difference between a t1 and t2? Well, the intuition is this. t1 minus t2 is just the distance between the two time points. That means if I pick any two time points in the series, as long as this time difference is the same, the covariance between these two random variables is the same. For example, the covariance between time 1 and time 3 is the same as the covariance between time 3 and time 5, and that's the same as the covariance between time 10 and time 12. The distance between all of these is 2. In other words, the relationship 
between each value in the time series remains constant over time. This actually makes a lot of sense in terms of autoregressive models. If this relationship were to change over time, then we wouldn't be able to fit any such model. That's why we want stationarity when we fit these kinds of models. For example, suppose our autoregressive model is y of t equal to 0.5 times y of t minus 1. But imagine if this were only true for t equals 2 and not t equals 3 and so forth. Then this equation doesn't work. In order for this equation to work, this relationship has to hold for all times. Note that this also implies that the variance remains constant over time. If it's true that the autocovariance depends only on the time difference, then it doesn't matter what time we pick. k11 is just equal to k00. k22 is just equal to k00. So that's why, if we see the variance change over time, as we do with volatility clustering, then we take that as evidence that the time series is non-stationary. You may recall that, earlier in the course, we assumed that stock returns were stationary. Recall that when we were calculating things like the mean and variance of our stock returns, we used data from the time series of stock returns to calculate the sample mean and sample variance. Using our definition of stationarity, now we know that this is possible only if the time series is stationary. If, for example, there was a trend, then trying to calculate the mean by adding up all the values and dividing by n would not make any sense. This would imply that mu at time t is not equal to mu at time t plus tau for all tau, violating stationarity. So understanding stationarity not only helps us do what we are doing now with the Rima, but it also helps us understand better what we were doing before.